presentation of implementation too, of course. Um, um, and thank you to all for being here. Um, I put my such a clear precise of time. Um, my topic is very different, but not that far from the previous one. Um, because uh, I want to talk about sustainability, of course, is a, a, a real renewable source whose sustainability it depends on uh, the use we do of it, which is heritage. Um, you know that um, it's very, we, we know that this is a very renowned uh, opposition. The uh, fact is that uh, this, the idea of uh, circularity works if, uh, provided that you are considering that you are dealing with not just one system at a time, so we have entanglement of systems, and uh, that you have to uh, not be too um, faithful to the models, because uh, you know that there is a so-called uh, Chinese Taylor syndrome, uh, dating back to a, an old diary from China in the 30s. There is an anecdote saying that there was once a European living in Shanghai, and he, he would, would like to uh, have a new suit. But at the time, there was no uh, European tailor there, so he called in a Chinese tailor. Asking him if he uh, would be able to uh, uh, copy and sew a new suit. So he said, okay, I can make it up, uh, provided that I, I can use a model. So the European searched and found uh, a very old, worn-out suit and gave it to him. After a few days, Taylor came back and, okay, it, no, it's, uh, fit him. it's perfect, it's fantastic. How do you do it? So it's, you like it? It's very, very, very much. So oh, I just one question, because he, he noted that on the shoulders, the tailor had made up a hole and mended it with a patch. I said, he asked him, why? Oh, I followed the model exactly. So the problem with models is not to be, you know, too faithful. Also because we have always local context to be considered, no? So we have no universal models. Even a circular economy is, of course, a general framework, but we can also take into consideration different versions of it. So, let's start. To, I, I want to, uh, wh what I'm trying to, um, to talk about is something, I'm sorry for the expression, I use it as a urban mind. So, a sort of intelligence working in every city that can be activated through some kind of situations, but I'll try to exemplify this. So, uh, just not be too, too much abstract. Huh? I want to show you just a very short video to exemplify it. The Cashua Chaka Bridge in Peru is rebuilt every year using traditional Inca engineering techniques by the local communities on either side. This bridge has been continually rebuilt in the same location since the time of the Incas. The entire bridge is built in only three days. To construct the bridge, grass coyo is harvested and then prepared to be woven into large cables, beginning with small cord, which is twisted together from the local grass. These cords are then twisted to form a larger rope, and the ropes are then braided to create a main cable. Up on the highway, the community works together to pull these ropes to stretch them out. These ropes are woven and twisted. 
Each rope is made from thirty of the small cords, and then three of these ropes are braided to form the cables that will support the bridge. After more stretching, the cables are then carried down to where the bridge will be installed. The old bridge is used to run the first cable across for what will become the new bridge. And then the old bridge is cut down and it falls into the water and is washed away by the river. All day long, the community pulls on the new cables to prepare them for the bridge. These supporting cables are anchored to the stone abutments on either side of the canyon. Vittoriano Arisapana is the architect of the bridge. And he uses traditional methods which have been handed down in his family for centuries. So, uh, what's a, what's at stake here? So, it's, we have uh, a bridge, which is a symbol of, of course, of togetherness, of communication, but at the same time, is a vital infrastructure for the communities. No, and is a very skillful work. No, so has to be rebuilt every two years, because. There are vegetal ropes, okay? So the, every two years, you have this social gathering to rebuild the bridge. And the bridge, basically, is the right version of the social relations. Because they participate all together to the work, and they celebrate at the end. So the celebration is not just, you know, social gathering because it's a nice party, no, no. It's the moment in which they think about what they are doing, so about the community itself. This is very important. Why I'm saying this? Because basically, the urban mind is this. Very simple in this way, but anyway. When you are through your activities, you are relating to the built environment, you are thinking through and with what you are doing and the tools I are using. So even the means of transportation, even your job, even buildings, and that's so, okay? But, but sometimes, and this is the case of cities, sometimes you can have also more formal knowledge. The urban mind can be spotted when you, the, the knowledge reaches this stage. So thinking about thinking itself. So very formal knowledge, okay? I know it's very abstract. I know. But I have a lot of examples now, so. <laughs> so, but this is about the idea that cities are mostly, the oldest form known of artificial intelligence. So 
<laughs> it's the it's, it's way we relate to each other. And the tradition, the tradition here is fundamental. Can be strange, no? It may sound strange. Because normally we think about tradition or something very no, fixed, stable. It's not that. The, like an anthropologist a new well, tradition is effective when it's renewed, reused, and changed by every generation. Because you have always, always different questions. You have to find new answers, employing the same tools. So this is the way you activate Right, I did this. Okay, it's very abstract. Right, go on. Huh? <laughs> okay. I will be very concrete because I'm talking about heritage, not about monuments, national landmarks, preservation, but about something which concerns everybody migrants and residents, which is housing the problem of housing. Oh, you say, which relation with heritage? There is, there is, of course. But you have to consider that, for example, when we talk about heritage, about uh, the cities, it's like we split the cities in two. There's historic part to be preserved, often becoming a sort of open air museum, for tourists to be contemplated with no affordable housing at all, of course. These are the large housing estates in the major, this is a sample of 14 major cities in Europe, but you see that in most of them, the majority of people lives there. That a large Estates, uh, the housing estates are not the same, for example, from Eastern Europe to Western Europe, or, uh, uh, for example, uh, in Stockholm, Northern Europe. They are very different, belonging to different periods and different, uh, in a sense, ideologies, but at the same time, they are part of cities, like the peripheries. We cannot think of cities just focusing on one part of them, no, the most valuable. To, uh, to save our cities, so that all cities, we need to think of them as a whole. So, this is not enough, of course. We have to free ourselves from the idea that we are too used to uh, employ the, some kinds of topics do not apply to our country. Please, answer. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. This is the stereotype. Why could be this Cairo? Oh my God, Cairo. So, but in Italy, the slum? So, you know that this slum dates back to, the, to <laughs> the earthquake of Messina, 1980, 110 years ago, it's still there. Of course, residence changed, yes. But you know, Sicily region hmm, applied <laughs> just recently to declare this by Italian government something, you know, an emergency, okay? 110 years after the earthquake, you know. Okay, it's heritage too, huh? No, <laughs> it's history. So, go on. Now, I have four examples. Hmm? I'll be very brief. I promise. But the first one is a bit hard because it's an historical example, but it's useful. 
And then we have three contemporary examples. So, how the city can become heritage? This is important because uh, you know that in, in, in English now is a very recent word because it comes from the, the French, uh, patrimonialisation, uh, how a thing can become heritage. But this is very important because it's the way they collect, uh, the, the, so they, um, all the society, uh, uh, the urban society can declare something heritage. So, for example, in Siena, you have a four-party device. We are talking about 14th century. Huh? So, you have the, the square, the piazza with the town hall, which is important because, I know, I, I prefer to, before to show you all the, all the part, it's better. This is the, huh? this is the complex. There is no piazza without the town hall. This is, is a, uh, uh, is, is really a whole, is this a system. Then you have the second part inside the town hall, which is the cycle of frescoes by Lorenzetti. Okay? Uh, at first, we have the piazza, is chronologically, we have first the piazza, town hall. This is mid 14th century by commission of the council of the governors. This is the location showing how should be the future of the city. The relationship between the city itself and the countryside. Okay? Please hold on because I, I, the explanation is that <laughs> it's uh, at the end of the. So, the third one is the world map. Now is destroyed, but was built by Lorenzetti too at the end of the, the cycle of frescoes, and showing the territory of Siena at the center was circular world map hmm? in wood, and could be rotated. Even was five meters of diameter. Was very very very, very large. Finally, the register so-called table of ownership, the tavola delle possessioni, which, which means the uh, cadastral register, no? Which there was a, a long, very long survey by the government of the city. So registering all ownerships, why? Because how, uh, owning a house will be the access, the right to be a citizen. Citizenship was tied to the ownership of the house. Okay? So this is the device. Because Lorenzetti, to portray Siena, employed the, the cadastre. So what you are looking on the frescoes is not an idealistic view of the city. It's like a uh, sort of cadastral portrait of the city. You see the real houses, the real men and women in their activities in the countryside in the town. Why? Because they have to identify themselves with the city itself. Through the right to be citizen and through the symbols of the city and the relationship with the outer world. Okay. This is just to show you why, now come to, to, to now, to today. No? What happened to the relationship between heritage and housing? Okay, you know which is, uh, what is Airbnb listing? You know, well, okay. Uh, my colleagues from the University of Siena uh, produced a very thoughtful research about Airbnb and their impact on the historic centers in Italy. And this was the result. This is Florence. Okay, oh, sorry, go on. <laughs> sorry. Okay, look. 
we have almost 20% of all the stock of Airbnb listing within the walls of the medieval historic centers. Okay? But the worst part is this, you know that is this promoted like sharing economy, but strangely enough, is not mostly one room to be rented, but entire flats. Today in Florence, it's impossible, not only in the center, to find affordable housing for anybody. Uh, just to, have, to give you an idea, of course, it's not a consequence directly from Airbnb, but commercial rent, okay, in Piazza della Signoria, is, at a, on average, is 27,000 euros a month. Okay? Venice is worse, but Venice is an exception for me. Okay, look. The nice thing that is there is no real distribution of income by Airbnb because very few of them earn the most of <laughs> the, the revenues from the rent and very little was distributed among the others because many agencies <laughs> used Airbnb just as a collector of offers and so on. So, really, really, the data are this. More than two-thirds So you know that this means that you are in, a, in cities in which you have a very well-preserved heritage, a very successful tourism business. At the same time, you have no affordable housing and not just for residents. Okay? So the last two examples of relation between heritage and housing one is a very strange example, is Palermo, okay? And the final one is uh, a project uh, of the UNESCO, we probably, Tomas will remember. Hey, we'll see. <laughs> this is the first one. Uh, around the last uh, 30 years, Palermo had a, a real huge abandonment of the historic center due to the pressure from criminal organization, you know? So, uh, shops, all little activities, street markets that were closed, okay? What happened that, um, this was of course, uh, there were a lot of, of course, uh, uh, speculation, uh, uh, about housing, not just in the middle. These, uh, these are the worst examples, of course. Can, can we can call it worst practices, not bad practices. But something happened. No? Uh, the municipality uh, ran a lot of projects to renovate the city center. The nice thing is that it wasn't their idea, but was the idea of migrants. Because the migrants began to occupy the historic center, or was abandoned, and from time to time, they found an agreement with the municipality. Running together a council to uh, plan and design all this, and even the street markets, the word, you had to think that Palermo had street markets since 8th century, okay, very old, they are reviving. And so what happened that the municipality oh, thought, okay, this is a bottom-up situation, no? 
So we can plan on this. So using this impulse to uh, work about the entire city. So you see, these are different other projects of renovation based on this first drive from the migrant occupation of historic centers. So it is, in a sense, it's an unplanning. It's not really planning, because what changes? The last one is an example of soft planning, which is different. You remember that in the 70s, the banks changed their role from uh, the credit to business investment to housing. No? At the same time, after 1973, after the Yom Kippur War, it was the rise of oil prices, so all new housing was too expensive. And UNESCO started to talk about renovation of all historic centers all along the, uh, the, the 70s. And this was a project supported by UNESCO. It was the district workshop by Renzo Piano. So what was the idea? It was this, uh, this a southern Italian city, Otranto, on the sea, on the Adriatic Sea. The idea was that uh, the restoration had to be uh, carried out uh, with some sort of um, participated activity of planning. So you know that today is a very fashioned way to talk about planning, you know, the participated planning, et cetera, et cetera. What the, actually this was probably the first example. And was this. This was the central place, the central square. They arrived with this cube. They opened the cube. And with help of uh, all the, uh, the residents in the district, they opened this structure, divided into four sections. The four sections were used to uh, diagnose the situation of the buildings, to choose which kind of activity to be carried out, to meet the residents, and to choose together which was the best way to proceed, and above all, to restore, showing of course the progress of the work, but above all, all the work was done not moving people from their homes was a very light intervention. See, this is, a very, uh, is an electric uh, car designed for purpose because it was very light for the paving of uh, the storage center. So there were the... Okay. The, my, the most important thing that people was not moved out of their homes. And today is still the best example we have in Italy of this kind of work. So why I'm showing this as a last example? Because uh, in a sense, here, there is the reversal of the figure of the architect as a sort of god, no? thinking, imagining, designing, so imposing a point of view on the city. But at the same time, the participation from all community was important, not just, you know, to have a consent about what we are doing, but was important because they perceived, they felt, the designers, that the social bond was the real basis to change the city. So 
you employ in this situation like the social gathering in Peru, you know. It's something carried out altogether, but concerning very vital issues like housing. So this is heritage, of course, but you have today in Otranto, notwithstanding uh, the success from the uh, tourism point of view, you find affordable housing still today. Oh, just now. Oh, uh, sorry. It's, uh, I put the timer to now. Okay. So, um, sorry for being so uh, uh, probably uh, too packed, but uh, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>